Uh, so obviously deciphering the role, we don't yet know, uh, and it's fun to give this talk here. Uh, the, the convergence of the people interested in ALS and those interested in RNA biology has been, I think, a, a wonderful uh, breakthrough in a way, in, in ALS especially. It's something that we weren't really looking at before uh, this discovery. So, so I'm a neurologist, and, and I'm going to start with a case, and this is an interesting case. I'll try and go through it quickly. So this was a 28-year-old woman who nine months before she presented, she first had some difficulty walking. This is right around the time she became pregnant, it turned out. After she delivered, she, the walking problems worsened. And she developed slurred speech. And this worsened over several months. So at one point she decided she would walk to the hospital, but she was turned away because they didn't have enough space. So then two weeks later, she couldn't walk or could barely walk, so she had to take a coach to the hospital and was admitted. And her past medical history was suppurative lymphadenitis. She was treated with silver nitrate for three weeks, but it was stopped, didn't have any effect. No family history of this disease. And on her examination, she had nasal speech, severe dysarthria, difficulty speaking, was drooling. Occasionally she would burst out into laughter or tears. This is a, something called pseudobulbar affect. And when you lose innervation to the brain stem, you lose control of the reflexes of laughter as well as crying. And so a minor sort of thing that's amusing, you might burst out into laughter. Or if something that's slightly causing you sadness, you'll cry immediately. So it's a very frustrating uh, symptom of this disease. Uh, she also had weakness and atrophy of the muscles, which is asymmetric, more on one side, with fasciculations, meaning twitching of the muscles, uh, stiffness of the muscles, and spasticity of the lower extremities, uh, with normal sensation. So they did electrical studies, and all they did was they, they shocked the skin. She could feel it, and then they would shock the muscles, and the muscles would contract. So there was nothing wrong with the muscles themselves. That's how that was interpreted. After three and a half years, this progressed. She was bed bound, could barely move her fingers. And then five years almost after uh, the onset of this illness, she developed respiratory failure and died. Uh, and this was her autopsy. So this is the lateral portions of her spinal cord. There was sclerosis and hardening of the lateral portions, which was B here and this A shows well, the loss or the shrinking of the ventral horns uh, and this was the first case described by Charcot in 1869. Uh, Charcot, of course, uh, a leader in the field of neurology, uh, highly revered at the Salpetria Hospital in Paris. Some of you may know this was a women's indigent hospital, so he was able to just follow these women over long periods of time. They lived there, uh, and he would wait until they died, and his major contribution was this clinical pathologic correlation, that he would see the clinical syndrome, he would then do the autopsy and find out what happened to them. And so these were the two cases that he described. Um, and this is now in 1869. So this is in a, in a later set of lectures that was translated. Uh, he's seeing an ALS patient and he says to him, you know, you should leave the room now and you'll be told in a minute what to do and to get well. And then he speaks to his colleagues in the room who he's teaching and he says, now that this person is no longer here, uh, we can be honest and say that the prognosis is deplorable and he's a lost soul and it's a question of time. And I think when I look through this stuff, uh, the, the, the striking thing is the case itself, other than the silver nitrate, now we would give people Riliotec, Riliazol, which is a, a drug. Otherwise, the, the, the case would be no different. The patient lived five years. That's the average survival today. The symptoms would be managed the same way. There's, there's essentially no change in this disease uh, in you know, nearly 140 years. So start with that and then get into this, which is uh, some recent discoveries in, in RNA biology that relate to this disease and, and hopefully provide some hope that we're going along a new path to develop treatments for this. So of course, I think everyone in this room, or many people in this room, know about this top point, and I'll bring up some, some background about how these two fields, ALS, from susceptible dementia, and TDP43, and RNA binding proteins, like FUS, combined. And then I'll talk more specifically about the, the science we've been doing, uh, making transgenic animal models of TDP43 predominantly, uh, trying to understand how it causes neurodegeneration. And, and then lastly, this, this piece of what does aggregation of this protein mean? I think that's something that uh, we've been very interested in. Uh, I think those who are sort of pathologists and, 
who came upon this protein as a clump of, of, of protein in, in a cell are interested, why is there aggregation and how does this relate to the normal function of the protein? So those are the, the things we'll talk about. So this is a, a slide from Don Cleveland, uh, recently published, and, and this was based on SOD1. And this slide is terrible. No, I tell, I've told Don this before, so he won't, if he sees this on the internet, he won't be that mad. Um, right, so, so number one, it's just filled with stuff. Uh, and and it, in some ways you look at it, I find it sort of like a greatest hits album, you know, or of, of the past. You know, like cytotoxicity was very popular at one point, so there was clearly cytotoxicity that must be involved. And, and you know, reactive oxygen species and mitochondrial dysfunction and axonal transport dysfunction, now proteasome dysfunction. Um, so that's one thing. And the other is you could actually just cross out ALS and just put Parkinson's disease, and it'd probably be the same slide. You could change a few small things. But clearly that what's on this slide is, is a series of things that are going wrong in the cells. And there's, this is all true. This is not to question any of the science. But it, why is this happening? Is this an upstream event or a downstream event? Um, probably the latter. The, the fact that you can see dysfunction, uh, you can see excitotoxicity, you see proteasome dysfunction, altered axonal transport in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease and ALS, it's probably not a very proximal or upstream event. So these have always been very frustrating to me uh, in terms of understanding what's causing this disease. And then the second thing that none of these explain very well uh, is this observation. So, so this is a, a slide made by John Ravitz with Alice Spada. And John Ravitz has been very interested in, in, in sort of describing to people the spread of ALS. And, and this, this even happened in the patient that was in this previous case because it started out with weakness in, in one arm and then spread to the other arm. And that is that ALS seems to start in one particular region of the motor system. So first of all, it, it likes to involve a certain set of neurons for some reason. We don't know why. But predominantly motor neurons in the spinal cord and in the brain. Uh, and so it initiates in those neurons. And then there's this phenomenon that, that does seem to happen. We don't know why, as it spreads. So when you are involved in your right arm, typically, the next thing will be involved will be your left arm. And then it will spread and involve your legs at a later time point. And John went through and, and looked at this in a whole series of cases. And, and indeed, this was true. It, it, and, and so the question was, why does it do this? So this is meant to show it initiates here. And it also often initiates in the same region of the upper motor neurons. And then it spreads around. And he was originally working on this as a virus and, and then perhaps other things now. But, but none of those things, altered axonal transport, reactive oxygen species, describes these fundamental aspects of this disease. Likewise, with Alzheimer's, we don't really know why the parietal lobe is, is predominantly involved or in, in Parkinson's, the substantia nigra. And so I think those are sort of the more fun questions. And, and with TDP43 and FUS and perhaps other things, we, we have the potential, we have ways of looking at that. That would sort of be the argument that I make together throughout the talk is that I don't know that we'll be able to find the answer, but there are ways you could use TDP43 and FUS to explain both of these. Why does it initiate in this particular set of neurons? And why does it seem to spread, perhaps? So another case. Oh, sorry, I forgot I was a neurologist, right? So this was actually a patient of mine, so I, so I feel better with it. So 46-year-old gentleman presented in May of 2003 with, again, trouble speaking and hand weakness. So in, in two, by 2006, completely unarthur, couldn't speak at all. Uh, and his wife called because he began carrying a loaded gun around the house. Um, which in the United States happens quite frequently uh, with the gun laws. So, so he, w he was not overtly threatening. I never really understood what that meant. She said he was carrying around. She didn't know what he was doing. Um, he couldn't talk to her. Uh, so his brother came and took the guns and, and removed all the firearms from the house. And then later on, and I, I love this picture of, of ALS for people who don't see a lot of patients. So he couldn't talk at all, but he had enough leg strength to kick in a door. He was very angry at something. Nobody really could understand why this was. And then the last thing was he started to hoard things. So he was looking around in the closets, and then he would move them all to one location in the house to be sure that everything was safe. These are behaviors that he had never had before. No, he, his wife said that he was normal. He had, n had never e either been impulsive or threatening, nor had he had hoarding behaviors or obsessions and compulsions. And so we performed an MRI on this patient, and we found that 
he actually had uh, shrinking of the, the frontal lobes. So these are the, the ventricles in the frontal lobes. They're expanded larger than they should be. I suppose I should put a normal patient on here for comparison, but there's atrophy of the frontal lobes of the brain bilaterally. And so that's, that's where the story went to this, right? So in fact, even for a very long time, we knew that ALS patients weren't cognitively normal. It's a common misconception. It's just that we can't measure it well because, the, for example, this gentleman couldn't talk. So, so when we normally measure someone's cognitive function, we have to be able to speak to them and find out what are you thinking? Why did you kick in the door? But uh, couldn't do that. So, so Bruce Miller uh, and Kathy Lomanhurst at UCSF were the first to sort of put this together. And they decided that, that yes, there were these two diseases, that they would measure if, if there was overlap because they thought clinically there might be some. Now these numbers are very generous, but it depends on how you measure it. Up to 50% of ALS patients have frontal lobe dysfunction. Uh, and this one I, I don't believe quite as well. It depends on how, again, if you stick a needle in their muscles, you see evidence of perhaps motor neuron loss, you'll see it in up to 50% of FTLD patients, frontotemporal dementia, and this is frontotemporal lobar degeneration. Um, and this syndrome prior to this is, is, has a lot of the features that I just told you about, that patients can have obsessions. They often will also have language dysfunction, and you can measure their language dysfunction. If you can't speak because your tongue is atrophic, you can't. But so that there was some overlap between these two diseases. And, and that's where TDP starts to come in, really. So, so Virginia Lee and John Trojanowski, again, those you know the story, came from this kind of a, a thinking. And they said, well, there's misfolded proteins in every neurodegenerative disease. And we should just figure out what the one is in ALS and FTD. So we knew there was amyloid and Alzheimer's disease. We knew there's synuclein and Parkinson's disease. What is it in ALS and FTD? So they went through this very long <laughs> process that, that I think everyone's glad they did. They basically looked at insoluble proteins. They had to do it with an unusual strategy by making monoclonal antibodies to them, but they managed to mass spec them, and this is how TB43 was found to be what they say, we don't know, is the predominant component of ubiquinated inclusions, that's what these things are here, in neurons in the brains of patients with both ALS and FTD. And the reason the overlap clinically is important is they wouldn't have actually known to look at ALS. So they first were looking at FTLD. And then they said, well, we knew there was clinical overlap. They looked at ALS, and they found aggregates of the protein in that disease as well. So, so this part, perhaps everyone in the room, or many people in the room, do not need to see. Uh, it turns out there were people working on TDP43 already. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's sort of funny. Because uh, uh, you can imagine that I'm sure a lot of the people in the neurodegeneration field go, oh my gosh, there were 10 papers on this already. Um, and and, and so, so indeed, it had been discovered tw what tw at least twice independently prior <laughs> um, as binding to different things, either binding to the TAR DNA sequence, uh, then binding to UG repeats upstream of, of uh, exon 9 of cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptor by someone in the room, right? <laughs> and. Uh, and so, yeah, it was known to do things, both regulate alternative splicing and then perhaps suppress transcription, sorry, of, of, a, of the LTR of HIV. Um, this actually wasn't known at the time. This has been learned later. Whatever it's doing is extremely important. Of course, you can't have an embryo. You can barely have a single cell without the function of TDP43. And it has this domain structure. And we've touched on this earlier when I was talking to uh, Professor Barale. The, it was called to, said to have this glycine-rich domain just because there were lots of glycines. It was not even thought to be functional or, or shown at that point. Um, but what was the disease? So what is the pathology? And this, this we throw around a lot. There's TDP pathology in this disease. So the pathology is this, that there's loss from the nucleus or decreased staining in the nucleus in the same cells that have a large hunk of it, sometimes one or other times lots of what they call skein-like inclusion. Uh, and then there's fragmentation of the protein. So this was from Virginia Lee's original picture. She said there's phosphorylation. There were high molecular weight species. There were low molecular weight species and that they were, there was phosphorylation of these. And I think when we say pathology, uh, we generally mean this whole conglomerate of things. Um, so, and this is of course driven a lot of the thinking about what's causing this disease is just this picture. Uh, is it loss of function from the nucleus? Is a gain of function in the cytoplasm? This thing is toxic and killing cells. Is it the fragments that are killing cells? We, we don't know. But essentially all of those hypotheses came from this. So that, that led to this type of thinking, that it's now 
TDP43 is misfolded like these other proteins and it's causing the illness. And uh, that, there was argument about that until uh, we and others found mutations in the protein, the disease. So this was one of my patients. He has flailed arm syndrome and he can't control his arms at all. As you see, they sort of flop at his sides. He has some weakness in his legs. Now he's wheelchair bound. Um, and this was his family that, that I had been studying. This is him. Uh, this was his father who died in our clinic, his uncle who died in our clinic, and then uh, his aunt who was alive at the time and I went to visit her. She developed symptoms at age 83 and actually had ALS. He's in his 40s. Uh, and so we, we screened them as well as a bunch of other families for mutations in TDP43. It's just a candidate approach. It was, you know, it was, it was aggregated in the disease. Maybe it's causing the disease. And of course, lots of people were doing this at the time. And we found this A315T mutation. That was the only one that we found. As you probably know, it's relatively rare, about 3% of familial ALS. So you don't have that many of these patients floating around. Yes, yeah. Does he have a family? Yes, this is his, uh, does he have, yes. In fact, uh, there are eight siblings of his that are not on this picture, and he has many children as well. And uh, we have genotypes for all of them, but we don't, they're, they're not affected at this point, but they're all young, in their 30s and 40s. So, find them, no, because that's the problem, I, I imagine for ethical issues that you never, you never see, you, this, uh, all the people that carry the mutation and, Yes. Well, we're following them, we, and, and they all live locally. But it's going to. This is part of the problem. Why do we only know three ALS genes right now? You know, we've been we've known the disease for 140 years, and we've been able to do genetics for 30. You know, you know. So it's actually because the pedigrees are small. So and, and they're very hard to follow up on. So so this was the biggest one. Uh, actually, of all the published TP43 families, this was the largest where all, all of the affected individuals were genotyped. There were larger families, but they didn't actually have the genotypes of those individuals. So this was four people that had segregated with disease. Um, you're right. It, it, this is a challenge. So we, we follow them, and, and hopefully we'll know. But this also brings up a problem as you, if you've been following the genetics of this. Why does it happen in sporadic disease, in just patients? And that could be because, you know, if you're 80, you, you well have died from something else. And, and then you would not have known. Uh, likewise, we often see pedigrees of families where this person has ALS and this person had you know, MS. But they were never really evaluated by a good neurologist and they died in three years of MS, which is very unusual. So it, it's been challenging to do the genetics in this disease. No getting around it. So then, of course, at the same time, Chris Shaw and many others were doing the same thing and found mutations right along this region of the protein. And then there's this one here, which I think is perhaps debatable. If it's underlined, it means it was in a family, and then in the other ones were seen in sporadic patients. As, as you, you know, most of the mutations are in this one region of the protein. Clearly, it's involved in mediating protein-protein interactions, which, again, was described here, and then, and then mediating splicing, um, as well as actually transcriptional suppression. So whatever this is, this sort of protein-protein interaction domain that mediates the function of the protein. Uh, but beyond that, we don't know. What do these things do to it? And, and I think um, we still don't know. Uh, this, of course, was another sort of uh, shift or a, a big discovery because it, it was the second gene of sort of the class of genes that was involved in ALS and, and, and really says, you know, understanding RNA biology or maybe still understanding protein aggregation or both, though we're not sure. <laughs> Um, and that is when both Chris Shaw and Bob Brown, who are close collaborators but had separate families, describe mutations in this protein. And, and as we discussed last night, they actually had many candidate genes. It was after the discovery of TDP43 that drove them to look at this gene very closely uh, and found mutations mostly in this C-terminal region that's obviously involved in nuclear localization. Now there are other mutations scattered throughout the protein, how these are all uh, affecting it. So uh, it's different from TDP. Clearly, most of these do affect its, its translocation into the nucleus or the, its occupancy time in the nucleus, whereas TDP mutations, as again, they don't do that. You can put the mutants into cells and, and they stay in the nucleus just fine. And so, but this really suggests some aspect of RNA uh, metabolism is involved in ALS pathogenesis. And I should also say that this is mostly ALS for some reason. So the patients that we see, there's very few that have frontodermal dementia. And the patients that I showed you, none of them have cognitive dysfunction. We've measured them very closely. So it seems to bias towards the ALS phenotype for some reason. So that's sort of the background. And again, I think those in this room know it very well. 
Um, so, so I'll move on to our sort of modeling and, and, and how we've been trying to understand this, how we've been trying to turn this uh, observation into some type of a therapeutic advantage for this disease that has no treatments. So we just made mice. Uh, <laughs> I figured that we were, we knew about the mutation early on, obviously, because we sort of found one and we thought that um, that was a good, it was worth trying. I knew that everybody and their brother I, I, would be making this mouse. I used to joke that they had just done the, the census and it said that like something like one in three Americans was making a TDD43 transgenic mouse. But uh, it seemed like that for a while. There are a lot. Um, so we made it both with the, the mutant that we had found and a, a wild type version under this prion protein promoter. And we had lots of founders, uh, f but most of them died before they could even be weaned and they wouldn't pass the transgene. Uh, so it's a very toxic transgene. And we only got one line that survived and that was this one here. So this, this prion protein promoter is actually quite good. It's, a, it's sort of a mini gene. So the, the transgene's embedded into two exons of the prion protein uh, where the coding sequence would normally be we put a tag on ours, uh, and, and this is where the mutation is, of course. And it expresses essentially like all other prion promoters. So uh, in brain and spinal cord at high levels, but everywhere else at some level, it particularly likes the testis as well. Um, this is on a flag immunoblot, so just seeing the transgene. This is on a TDP immunoblot, and uh, there's several things on here, you know, but we, we estimated it to be about threefold. I have no idea exactly. It's very hard to know for sure. We did many blots and that was sort of the average of what we would see in spinal cord. Um, and, and you might notice that this is a little less here. And in fact, we noticed it then too. We just weren't sure what it meant and we didn't want to make a big deal out of it because we figured we'd have to explain it. Uh, <laughs> so, so we just kind of kept quiet and nobody said anything. Um, and we'll come back to that later. So, so what happened to these mice? Um, and so th they get sick and they die. Uh, this is one of them that's in the late stages of disease. Um, so this mouse is not moving its rear legs as much as it should be, obviously, sort of dragging itself with its, high, uh, with its front limbs. It is not quite like SOD1. We, we also study those mice, which are more the first model of ALS. And uh, indeed, a SOD mice usually just get complete paralysis and drag their legs like that little, the complete, all the time for, for an extended period of time. Uh, in the TDP mice, it's different. And even at these, I, I had a, another age, it's just sort of boring picture of the mice walking slightly abnormally. Even when you start to see them walk abnormally, they don't have changes in lower motor neurons, in the spinal motor neurons at that time. Uh, they predominantly have changes in the spinal cord and in the brain. I'll show this in a minute. But this is the survival curve here. Uh, the females actually live about a month longer. This is a bigger survival curve than the one we originally published, but um, about a month longer than the males. And, and the, they, this is the onset of weight loss. So we're using this as a measure of onset of disease. And uh, it, this is not that uncommon. We're still trying to figure out why. It could be partly the transgene uh, is expressed higher in males, although we've looked and it doesn't seem to be. Uh, so why there's this big male-female difference, we don't know yet. Um, People ask about human ALS, there's, there is a difference. There's, a, there's an increased incidence of, of ALS in males, but the severity of disease is not greater. And this would be severity of disease if you were going to get it, not whether you get it or not. So I don't know how this relates to that, to that observation in humans. So this was uh, the pathology in these mice. So this is with the flag transgene tag. And first to say that I had lots of pictures, but it's expressed, and this is just a DAB stain in nuclei all over. This is in the hippocampus, uh, in every part of the brain, in every layer of cortex, in every cell in the spinal cord. And, and by the way, you can't quite tell, but it's in, it's in oligodendroglia. It's in the ependymal cells here around the central canal, and it's also in uh, astrocytes. It's everywhere. Um, but they get this, this sort of selective neurodegeneration. So in ubiquitin staining here, what you see is, and this is obviously very low power, this is the motor cortex, cortex. you see these neurons predominantly in this layer five region that are, that are lighting up with uh, ubiquitin stain. Uh, and this is a bit higher power picture of those. Uh, these were predominantly pyramidal neurons. They would sometimes have these large inclusions in them, other times sort of small inclusions. And then in the spinal cord, you see something similar. So predominantly ubiquitin positive neurons uh, in, the, in the ventral horn. There are other sort of scattered interneurons, of course, 
And, and those of you who chase the ALS, that, that's very common in ALS, it turns out. Again, we focus on this, the relative vulnerability of motor neurons, and that's higher. But other neurons do get involved. So this is uh, a nissel stain of, of the cortex, and, and I think you can tell that there, there is these sort of uh, larger, with large amounts of nissel staining substance neurons in layer five, and these are sort of lost in the late phase of this mouse. So there's predominant neurodegeneration in these neurons for some reason. And this is, I like this one as well. So this is sort of neuroinflammation and, and gliosis. And the gliosis picture I really like, so it's just predominantly again here. In fact, in this low power image that you can take, you can see it right along here. Uh, and this is microglia. So, so yes, there's neurodegeneration, there's activated microglia. Um, do they have ALS? Well, the first thing to know is that, that lateral sclerosis is it's not actually not even something you should be looking for in mice because mice don't have lateral columns descending the innervation uh, from the motor cortex. So theirs and marsupials and other creatures have it in the dorsal column, which is of course where most of the sensory ascending fibers are. Uh, so they have a very different system and people have wondered how relevant it can be to actually study uh, the motor system, but you can. Uh, so if you look, you can look here and here, there are some. This is in the lateral columns. There are degenerating uh, axons that are, that are swollen um, as well as dark. And then here is in the dorsal columns. So, so there were some in both, and, and, and we're still not sure where these are coming from, if they're coming from primary motor cortex or other lower brainstem descending pathways, which, which again, can be involved. Um, so this means there were lots of degenerate axons and, and loss of axons. You saw some of this already, but, so this picture already. This, there were, there were a decrease in the number of spinal motor neurons at the age of death, but this is nothing like in an SOD1 animal, which would be down at 50%, sometimes 40% at the age of death. Um, there's denervation of muscle fibers, and this is just an EMG where you stick a needle in the muscle and you see this activity consistent with the involvement. So we show this to say, yes, there's involvement of upper and lower motor neurons, but it's, it's very clear that in, in this disease, the upper motor neurons are, for some reason, whatever they're getting, these mice, uh, are more involved. So this is where it got strange, right? So, <laughs> um, so everyone said, well, of course, you've got TDP. It was found in aggregates in the humans. And now you've put too much TDP into the mice and it's killing them. It's just going to cause aggregation of the protein. How relevant is that? And, uh, and I don't know, but on, it turns out there's not much, if any, TDP43 in the inclusions. Uh, so this was a, a, a spinal motor neuron. This is a, a layer 5 cortical neuron. There's still plenty of TDP staying. This is with the typical protein tech and terminal antibody of TDP43. This is ubiquitin and there's no TDP in this thing. And if you look, this is a layer 5 cortical neuron. I think it's two things here. One is there is a decrease in staining of TDP in this, in this neuron that is accumulated ubiquitin. Uh, there's an aggregate in it, but again, it's not positive. So we, we stained with everybody, anybody we could. We didn't find any. We published it as such. We subsequently found this, this uh, phospho-specific antibodies. And in a very small percentage of cells, you can see positive staining material. And this was reported in the subsequent mice. And it was sometimes meaning from Len Petricelli and Phil Wong and the, the other groups who published mice. And it was sometimes used as to comment that they're different, but I, I don't think the mice, any of the mice are really any different. They're mostly the same. Uh, it's just that, you know, we used a different antibody. Uh, if you stain with phospho TDP, occasionally you'll see this. This is the only neuron out of 10 mice that we found that has the classical pathology of TDP43. Remember we talked about that. So loss from the nucleus. So here's the nucleus on DAPI, so you can still see it. So there's loss of TDP from the nucleus. It's in the inclusion, and it's sort of ringed with ubiquitin. But you, you almost never see that. We found one, so we put it on the slide. It's just misrepresenting it to even show it. So, so whatever is causing these mice to die, it's not the aggregation of TDP43 in the cytoplasm. That, that can be dissociated from that degeneration. Um, what, is, what is in these inclusions? Um, so, we didn't have a good job of this. We, we tried some EM, but couldn't find any inclusion containing ones. I don't know if you've played with EM. It's often hard to find the things you're looking for. But, um, but Len Petricelli did, and they found the one that had tons of mitochondria in it, this inclusion, and, and, and then they stained it with COX-4, sorry, and showed that there was staining, and then Phil Wong's group did the same thing and showed HSP-60, so that there's mitochondria. I think Phil knew about this, by the way. I mean, you know, anyhow. <laughs> so they said, you know. Um, so there was mitochondria in these things, and, and we've gone back, we published these pictures, sort of, of these massive inclusions in spinal motor neurons that, that they're not, this is the nucleus of TDP43, there's something pushing it to the side, but the TDP43 is still in the nucleus, at least in that neuron. 
Um, if you stain with Cox4, you can see some positive material. We have better pictures now, but this is a common thing. There are mitochondria in these inclusions. I, I don't know what this means. Of course, there's a lot of arguments, I think, on that first slide, or one of the slides, that mitochondria are involved in the pathogenesis of ALS. May, I, I don't know what the connection is, though. I think it could be direct, it could be indirect. We're, we're still trying to figure that out. So what about these fragments? Um, that were seen in the human pathology. Well, we looked for those, and you see them. Uh, not to be too complicated, this is that sort of fractionation scheme that Virginia Lee used to look at insoluble material in the disease. <laughs> so we did see some small fragments of TDP, but it was mostly in the, in the low solve fraction, this without any detergent at all. So you could easily extract these. They were not insoluble. We still don't know why. Um, and they appear very early in disease. This is just to say, even before the mice get sick, you see these things. I don't know what they are. It's, 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 Consistent with the idea they could be pathogenic, people have expressed these fragments in, in cells and culture, and Len Petrocelli had some nice papers on that. You can kill the cells, um, but you can kill the cells with full-length TDP and lots of things. I, I don't know. Um, they're there. Uh, whether they're causing disease or just a consequence or a degradation product, I don't know. Um, so, so what are the features of these first mice? Well, they, they do seem to have selective vulnerability. Uh, inclusions are rare, and these other features are there. This is more pictures of sort of loss of neurons uh, of TDP from the nucleus that, that we did see. And, and to point out, by the way, this is loss of both the transgene and the uh, endogenous. So Virginia Lee recently had a paper, again, for those who've been following this, saying that you lo lose the mouse. And that may happen first, right? You lose the mouse transgene, but then eventually, actually, even the, the transgene itself, the protein product, at least from it, is, is no longer detectable in the nucleus. And this is prior to them dying, if you look by other stains. So I'm not sure what that is. All right, so we didn't get a wild-type mouse, and we, we didn't have multiple lines, so we decided we'd take a different strategy. And so what we did was we just dropped a, uh, this is now unpublished, so we dropped a, a flock stop signal upstream of the transgene. And you can then not have transcription of this until you cross it to a career combinase expressing mouse and then you will actually make it and that works. So here's a tag on the transgene. If you cross it to the actin cream mice in the same one, you'll turn on the transgene. You'll see this is on the flag, this is on the endogenous. It's, it's at lower levels now and the, the endogenous band is still here. It's not the greatest western in the world, but and so we got lots of lines. One thing to, to the way this happened was, you, know, you put the transgene in, and it goes in in tandem, but then you put in a Cree or combinase site. So what happens is you cross the Cree and then the Cree takes out all of your tandems and then you essentially get uniformly expressed, all of our lines of this new format, at least cross to this Cree, express ex almost equal levels and it's completely driven by a single copy of the prion pro protein promoter. And it turns out, for whatever reason in the brain, it's about one time, it's almost equal to the endogenous TDP43. So we have multiple of these lines and, uh, and, and these lines. And the bottom line is, I don't know if I have a slide on this. Yeah, so, so these mice are here uh, and somewhere in here, and they don't get sick. <laughs> they don't get anything, as far as we can tell. They're, some of them are out to almost two years old, and they have no pathology. Uh, we have them you know, swimming around the water mazes and doing various things to see if there's anything wrong with them. Uh, but thus far, they're fine. And that's, this is them here, okay? And this is our original line. Uh, and there's one thing that's quite striking about that, of course. Now this is an even a better blot, perhaps. What happened to the endogenous TB43, right? So we, we have this model, I don't know, you know, just to kind of, we didn't put all this together ourselves. We're trying to read between the lines. No one's really been able to prove that in mice, at least, there's a big difference between wild type and mutant. In rats, there seems to be. <coughs> And some, in some flies there is, except that it's reversed, in other flies it's not. Have you noticed this? Sometimes the fly, mut the mutants are more toxic, so other times they're less toxic. We don't know why. So, so what's going on in these? So, so what else can we do with these mice, now that I've made expensive mice that don't have, don't get sick? <laughs> <laughs> right, that, so AIMS 1 and 2 get crossed out. Um, so AIM 3 was, was better, uh, so, so we'll see what happens. So, so, of course, this is an interesting point, and we got to why do these certain neurons, why are they vulnerable in this disease? And we discussed this earlier. So these are our mice in layer 5 predominant pathology. And it's very easy to go through the Allen Brain Atlas and say, are there layer 5 specific genes? And, of course, there are. You can see this region, and you'll find hundreds of genes that have predominantly expressed in, in layer 5. So is it the case that TDP43 has specific targets that are expressed in these cells, which are then misplaced or misprocessed, which then cause neurodegeneration that only happens in those cells? And it's an interesting idea, uh, we don't know. How can you figure this out? And, and partly we designed these mice 
so that we can answer this question. And what I'm going to show you is our, our set of, so we've been collaborating with Bob Darnell to do CLIP. There's several CLIP papers were just published. But the, our strategy is a little different, and I hope that in the long term it will help understand some of these questions. And that is that we, we the actin Cree version, it's expressed in all neurons in the spinal cord. And in in, we've already crossed it to Crees that are specific to motor neurons. So not only can we use the same system to pull down the transgene, because it has a tag from spinal cord, uh, we can do it only in certain cells. And, and we're, we don't have that quite yet. What I'm going to show you is from whole spinal cord. But we can also do it with mutant versus the wild type, because the tag is specific. So if you did it with TB43 antibody, you would pull down both. But if you do it with a tag in a transgenic animal, you'll just get the transgene. Um, and perhaps it's good that these mice didn't get sick, because one could argue that the dosage levels were interfering with the system, and you aren't really seeing where it normally binds, perhaps. Um, so w if those of you aren't familiar with this, I mean, I, I can give you the simple version. You just cross-link it with UV light. Uh, you mush everything up, pull down the TB43, and then sequence everything that came out. Of course, it's much harder than that, for those of you who've tried it. <laughs> um, and, and we're working on getting it to work in our own hands, uh, but w this first set that we did with Bob Darnell, and I think I've already sort of mentioned what's the utility of this. So this is our first run, and actually it turns out this run is bad. So we're, we're analyzing a second uh, set of data. And the reason is when, when, when Bob developed this technique, Bob Darnell, for NOVA binding sites, the NOVA binding site, of course, is only four nucleotides, and it's YCAY, and it doesn't have a repeat element. And so you could only have, say, 25 base pair reads and have a YCAY and map it very easily in the genome. If you use TDP43 and you have, say, 30-something base pair reads, but then a large portion of that's also your tag, then you're mostly going to get this as your, as your RNA clip tag, which is very hard to map to the genome because it maps everywhere. You need to only map unique sites. So in fact, this was, was, a, was a challenging run. So if anyone's going to try this, I, I recommend two things we're, we're learning. Number one, don't rna it for as long. You actually rna to, to break these into smaller fragments. Um, and the other would be do as long reads on a sequencer as you can. <laughs> so that way you can map it. <laughs> so this is what happened to us. So, so we did get a fair number. This is not nearly as many rat mapped reads uh, as this is only a small fraction of those that were come out of the machine. But we still get plenty, and, and there's about only 3,000 peaks. Of course, peak calling is, is you just turn it up or down. So, so um, in, in Uli's paper, I think there were 111,000 peaks. In, in Don's paper, I don't remember, there were 6,000 genes that were regulated. You know, so a very large portion, you, you, that, that's hard to understand, because then it's regulating every gene. So, so we'll have to see how this all plays out. It, it seemed roughly the same. We had a lot of extragenic sites, and this is, I think, a lot of noise from the aligner because of repetitive sequence. Okay, so I, I'll give you that caveat, and we're, we're looking the, the the new version. Um, if you then go through the, but the, the ones which are intragenic, uh, they're similar, although there's sort of a, there is a change in the pattern with the mutant, and we, we have no idea what this means yet. I'm just sort of going to point out some data and say where we're going with this. I'll be interested to see what people think. Um, why the mutant would bind to different sites? I, I actually expect that it won't. <laughs> I'm kind of hoping the result, which will be interpretable, is they're not different. If they are, though, perhaps there, there are ways you could explain it. You know, if its occupancy time was truly outside of the nucleus more, perhaps it is binding to more 3 prime translated regions or other types of, of RNAs uh, for some reason. So, so we'll find out. I would just say that there, we're finding some differences at this point. I don't know what it means. These are what some of our tags look like. This would be the good point to say you're, you're mapping problem. So you have mostly this you know, core TG repeat and then this small amount of sequence at the edge of it that you're catching your reads that hopefully you can map with. And you know, this is in TAF11. There's many, many different sites that we found. These were the intronic binding sites, of course, that look sort of typical. Um, then there's these, these three prime and translated region binding sites that, that people are finding. These are sort of interesting. They're sort of dirty. And they bind all along. You know, and the, so the peak collar will say there's one here and here. But really, who knows? The binding site is all along here. Um, so there were many different candidate genes, and, and we're, we're getting there. Um, but ultimately, what we want to do is correlate changes in the mouse with changes with the clip binding sites. Because the idea is we overexpress the protein that's killing the, these certain neurons. Which transcripts in those cells is it dysregulating that's causing the death? Well, thus far, we've only been able to find one that makes sense. And I think, again, everyone in this room, many will know this. So, so this is... These are the transcripts that are annotated for mouse for TDP43. 
Um, this is the clip seek tag. I, I don't have a scale here. There are only nine, something like that, nine reads here. There was a very weak clip seek uh, peak for us. It does sort of land right on top of where it's been described three times now. <laughs> and uh, first uh, by, by Dr. Barala. Uh, and so the, this is the clip seek tag. And it's from the wild type, uh, actually, I believe, uh, low-level expressor. Now, this is the high-level overexpressing TDP43 line in a non-transgenic RNA-seq experiment. And there's, this is a little biased. We've gone back, but the human transgene is overexpressed, in fact. So you have to set your aligner different, and we didn't have it here. So this region, the transgene, the stop codon is about right there. So, so everything here back is indeed mouse sequence purely. But the stuff up here, this big peak, is because there's a lot of homology between human and mouse. And so the aligner put them both in there. And so we've gone back and done it without the mismatches allowed, and it, and it comes back to normal. But it still shows this finding, and that is that this exon here is clearly differentially spliced um, it, from the RNA-seq from a non-strangenic mouse in, in here. And that, so that corresponds to this. And if you look at it uh, by a prediction of the level of these, what you see is these are the low-level expressors here. And this is the high-level expressor that gets sick, right? These do not. So you do see a shift in the, and in fact, it's almost up to, you know, 14-fold or something like that uh, in the low-level expressors. That you see no level of change in the protein. Um, in it, in it, however, in the high-level of expressor, there's a big, much bigger shift. Now, as, as we talked about earlier, this is a vanishingly small level of message at baseline, and so this fold change doesn't mean that much. I mean, I think you can interpret across lines, but to, but to say within one what that means, I don't know. And you can see that the full-length transcript does go down, and it, it's mostly down in the high level, but, but is also down in the other two. And these other ones, again, this is a little based on the prediction algorithm, but are, do not seem to be as much changed. So there is one target, and, and this, this, of course, we showed you, correlates with the level of protein. So for some reason, this... this mice getting neurodegeneration correlates with the loss of autoregulation of TDP. And really the question we have now is, does it correlate with loss of regulation of many, many other targets, or no other targets? What, what are they? So that's what we're really working on now, and, and I, I, I would tell you more if I knew more. We're still trying to figure this out. Um, but just going through by hand, this was the only target that was easily verified. Uh, that would be this one. And of course, uh, those in the room may have seen this before, and, and that, that is, this looks familiar. Uh, there's, you can see this same dosage response loss of autoregulation of TDP43 in the mice as, as was seen in, in inducible cell lines. And that what I think is striking, although I don't know what it means, is that this is you get neurodegeneration and this you don't. So that's what we're focused on now with those mice. All right, so that's the end of the mouse part. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this C-terminal domain and aggregation and this story we have and see what you guys think. So, so we've got pathology of TDP43. It turns out it's in, it, it was initially thought to be specific to FTLD and ALS. But that's completely untrue. In fact, it's hard to find a neurodegenerative disease where you don't have TDP43 pathology. So uh, if you hit yourself in the head or someone else hits you in the head a lot, dementia pugilistica from fighting, you will get lots of TDP pathology. Uh, and also in essentially every disease. I was mentioning this earlier, the place that you always want to show is the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, because there's lots of nuclei, and then you can find a cell <laughs> that has a change, or, or multiple in one field. It's not that common of pathology, even in ALS and FTD. This is, this is again, this is in the uh, hippocampus, see all the nuclei here. Why are they showing that? It's not a site of pathology of FTD. You don't get memory problems in FTD. It's because it's where you can show the p TDP pathology. Um, so. Yes, there's the, in, in even inclusion body myositis. So any, any disease of muscle where you have aggregates of protein, you'll find TDP43 outside of the nucleus and aggregated. And then, of course, there's this where Mike Strong just cut the facial nerve. I think he may have been sciatic nerve. I don't remember. And you see, I didn't show you the controls, and it is a little blurry, but the TDP43 seems to go from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. So you can almost rec recapitulate an aspect of pathology of TDP just by causing a stress to the system. So what does this mean? What does TDP pathology mean? Um, so we don't know, but we were, I mean, I, thinking, I suppose, very simply, and we, we saw that the mice had aggregates of ubiquitin proteins, and we thought maybe 
the ubiquitin proteasome was dysfunctional. So we, we had some cell models of TDP and we threw proteasome inhibitors on them to see what it would do. We've done lots of stressors, lots of people have done this. And, and you can take, these are cost cells and works in many cells. And if you, you do have to express a cherry fusion version of it, that's what this is, but then you get TDP out in a, a ubiquitinate occlusion in the cytoplasm. And we figured it didn't mean that much, but, but maybe that means that TDP in, in response to seeing, and it works actually with autophagy inhibition, both, both in vivo and in vitro, and I won't go into that data, but Chris Wallace has some really interesting data on that. So the TDP will leave the nucleus and you can find an inclusion. So maybe this is just a response to having this folded proteins in the cytoplasm and the TDP43, this is the way we're thinking, we don't know this is true. The TDP43 is sensing that there's most folded proteins in the cytoplasm and it's, it's leaving, maybe it's even going to bind to them. So I went to, to my friend, again, Chris Wilde down the hall, I said, let's find a protein that aggregates in the cytoplasm, just put it there and see what happens to TDP rather than just this toxin that probably inhibits a lot of things. And this is what we chose. The first thing he had was polyglutamine, uh, pure polyglutamine, Q80, and this thing is wonderful if you like making aggregates in cells, so that it forms these large aggregates in cells, it displaces the nucleus here. And this is TP43 staining, and I hope it's, you can see it pretty well. So, so here are two normal cells that don't have aggregates, and this is a cell that has TP43, and, uh, or has, sorry, polyglutamine, and then the TP43 has been sucked into this thing, and is gone from the nucleus, and there's even, you can see three cells in one field, so we were able to get multiple cells in one field. <laughs> so, you know, it happens often. In fact, it really happens in every cell that gets a, that gets a polyglutamine aggregate. It's a robust effect. Uh, so if you don't have an expanded polyglutamine, you don't see this. And if you, then we tried other proteins. So another protein you can cause to, to aggregate in the cytoplasm is dinactin. We thought this would actually work. Dinactin mutations that cause Perry syndrome, which is a Parkinsonism syndrome, cause lots of TDP pathology in patients. We thought, oh, we'll see it there. But you don't. The TDP stays in the nucleus. It doesn't care about these inclusions, which are also ubiquitin positive, or these other, which were a cavilin 3. We started trying other things. It seems to really like polyglutamine. So, so why is that? Um, and, and to say that this was just to show, it doesn't just sort of touch it and, or be there. It's tightly integrated into the inclusion. So this is just a filter trap assay of insoluble proteins. And if you express polyglutamine uh, Q80, then you, you pull down the TDP43 if you basically isolate the insoluble proteins and then run it through a filter that catches the insoluble proteins. And the TDP43 gets co-integrated into these. So it's very tightly incorporated into these insoluble aggregates. Uh, so this was interesting, and then, uh, then I read this paper, <laughs> um, which was, our, so, so in fact it had already been shown in, in human pathology, the TDP43 uh, co-localizes with Huntington uh, Huntington is a polyglutamine protein, uh, and, it, and this is for Huntington, this is TDP43, and, and if you merge the two, they're there. So this, this is happening in vivo in patients who have a polyglutamine disease. So, so where, do, you know, on the protein uh, do you need to get this? So we express these cherry fusion proteins. If you overexpress it, then you do retain some of the nucleus, but you also get it in the aggregate. And, you know, we did a sort of a typical deletion series, which is shown here. And essentially it's, I think I'll show, yeah, so I mean it's this region here, right, that's required. Um, and, you know, you can even make deletions within this region, it, it sort of partially diminishes it, but it kind of takes this whole area here. So, okay, that's interesting. Um, so, so then I had to learn about polyglutamine aggregate interacting proteins because I didn't know this field well enough. And so people had been proposing that polyglutamine aggregates are toxic by sequestering other proteins into them for, for quite some time. And they, they had purified them and so shown several things. One is Krebs binding protein and Tata binding protein have their own polyglutamine stretch, but it's not expanded to disease length. So these domains exist in a lot of things, particularly transcription factors and some RNA binding proteins. And so it sequesters those. But then there's this other class, these QN rich proteins, and, and one that had been purified in 2008 by pulling down the aggregates of Huntington, or maybe even polyglutamine, and then seeing what it was, was FUS. Actually, I thought that was very interesting. And there are other RNA binding proteins. And then there are chaperones. These do not bind as closely. So if you do that filter trap assay, they won't be in there. So, so what is this thing? And, and so I don't know. I, I mean, I, we're trying to be cautious in this reinterpretation of this domain. But there are lots of Qs and Ns. And the, the richness is not high, but it's certainly high enough. It's similar to FUS. And in this particular region, which was critical, it was 31%. And that was as high as any other QN-rich binding protein, or QN-rich polyglutamine binding protein. 
So we sort of said, well, this is an argument that this is what's called a prion-related domain. And I'll, I'll show this slide first, and then I'll go back to what those are. So Aaron Gittler and, and colleagues have been coming from the yeast prion uh, area, and, and they were onto the same idea. And they published this review saying if you, if you train an algorithm on these things that are called yeast prions, that have QN-enriched domains, they tend to misfold uh, on this URI2 and other proteins, and then you sick it onto the human genome, all 30,000 proteins or however many, uh, you'll find a list of proteins. And TDP and FUS came up with this domain, and this domain is sort of like number 16 and number 20, very highly predicted to have this type of a domain. Um, this is more than just QN richness, so this was a, I can't remember, was a neural net algorithm or another one to try and predict, because the, the, this is not a, a reliable domain in the terms of which amino acids or is there a repeat structure, it's sort of a disordered domain. So, so what are these things? So in yeast, there's, there's several good examples. Uh, these things, particularly this one in sub-35, tend to misfold and then actually form amyloid, and they will recruit the native form of the protein into this aggregate inactivated, and under times of stress, this protein is normally involved in translational termination, but it will actually stop being able to do that. And the yeast apparently can then uh, sample a large amount of genetic space that was beyond their stop codons, that it has some survival advantage to them under conditions of severe stress. In which case, once that's over, they can, they can revert to a normal state, uh, and then they will, be, they will be back to normal. And this is the domain that's responsible for that, and it was one of the first that they said it's QN-rich and it's a prion-related domain. This is not a disease prion, it's, it's a, it's a yeast-inherited protein. So, so have there been any of these in other species? And, and in fact, there are. Uh, this is a plesia, and Eric Kandel's lab showed that there is an RNA-binding protein. It's actually CP, CPEB, which in, in, there is one in, in, in mammalian cells, but it doesn't have a QN-rich domain. It's sort of a modular domain. It wasn't stuck on there. In these cells, it does, and this thing, goes between being aggregated in synapses to being disaggregated. It binds to mRNA predominantly in the aggregated state, and it regulates synaptic function. So again, the, the, the aggregation of the protein is somehow connected with the function of the protein. Uh, and then there's already an example, essentially, of this in, in mammalian cells, and, and uh, uh, Anderson's group had showed this a while ago, that TIA1, which is domain structure-wise very similar to TDP43, has a tendency to aggregate in the context of stress to be critical for forming stress granules, and that it required that C-terminal QN-rich domain in the protein to, to aggregate and, and to mediate this uh, function. Now, these are not amyloid. The, these are of highly reversible within minutes even, whereas these are, all, are nearly irreversible. The, the reversibility of this is rare. So the question is, is it this same sort of phenomenon taking place in all these different systems, although perhaps the reversibility of it is different? So this is the kind of model we're, we're playing with, right? So, so to try and explain both the aggregation of the protein, and I, I know everyone hates models and everyone's got their own model. I won't dwell on it. <laughs> but, you know, we're, we have to have something. So, 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 you know, you have normal function of TDP in the nucleus that perhaps under conditions of transient stress, I, I, again, the stress granule piece of this, I don't know how strong it is because it's a, in our hands a rare phenomenon in most cell lines. But clearly, if it were to go to any RNA granule in the cytoplasm, it, in, in particularly neurons, that might be different. Hippocampal neurons, that might be different, for example. There is some evidence for that. And that maybe that mediates a response, that in fact that alters metabolism. If you can respond to that, then it goes back in. Maybe there is some type of shuttling or regulation of its function in that respect. Well, if that's true, Perhaps under prolonged stress, you know, you may get an aggregate form as a consequence of these things. You may get direct neurodegeneration or degeneration. Uh, and that, you know, in the mice, perhaps, they don't form aggregates as well. You know, people have argued that aggregates are protective, right? So that, in fact, you, maybe, we, you know, we can do this very well, mice can't, and that you just get a degeneration without the sort of aggregation, we do get lost from the nucleus. You don't see as much accumulating in the cytoplasm. And this has the chance to, ex to explain this. So if the stress in Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, you know, proteotoxic stress, there's lots of misfolded proteins, much like the MGD3132 result that we showed in cells. And that's stressing the cells, and TDP43 is leaving the nucleus. It can even form aggregates. Um, maybe it's helping those cells respond to stress. Um, and then, of course, how do the disease mutations tie in? I mean, my favorite idea 
is that indeed it, it's more in this phenomenon, not, the, not which targets is it regulating, not how well it does it, but in fact that it shifts this arrow perhaps more to this side because it changes the rate aggregation proneness of the protein. And if there's anything that's sort of been somewhat reliable in terms of those measures, I think it's that. And at least in vitro, you purify the protein. The, the mutants do seem to aggregate more quickly, though the wild type aggregates extremely well. I don't know if you guys try to make bacterial protein, it's hard, <laughs> hard to keep that stuff in solution. So, so that's the kind of thing we're working on. All right, and I, I have this last thing. It's not, it's two slides, but so, so can we make drugs for the patients? Should we modulate TP43 aggregation? I don't know. Um, we may as well try. Uh, it may be terribly toxic. I think one could, you know, so if we were to increase the aggregation or decrease the aggregation, both may be bad, but we may as well try. And then we have some mouse models we can play with or cell line models. So should we make an, a, an assay for this? So we did this FRET assay. I, I don't know if any, again, other people may have been playing with this. Um, it's been done for other neurodegeneration proteins um, that basically you just fuse it. This is the construct. This is a control construct that doesn't aggregate as much. So it turns out just deleting this glycine rich domain will almost completely abolish the aggregation of the protein. Uh, if, you, if you do the 25 kilodalton fragment, as it's called. So you start with an artificial fragment already, which does aggregate quite readily. If you make small deletion in it, it actually cause, doesn't allow it to aggregate as well. Uh, so again, supporting that this domain is so critical for self-aggregation. And you can use these and put different colored fluorescent proteins and develop an assay that then reads out the control protein, the aggregated state, and then the disaggregated state here, and say, can we make drugs that sort of push it this way? And we're in the process of this now. Uh, this was an accident. I'm not trying to protect myself or anything. These are, these are Johns Hopkins places. So these are all drugs that are known and you can't patent them, but for some reason when I translated this, it didn't work. But yeah, we're starting to see things that both increase the signal of the fret and decrease it. We're having to validate that they're not just messing up the fret or, you know, there, there are a lot of things. But, but we are going to find things, I, I hope, that, that modulate this process and that we can then perhaps look at is whether they might be therapeutically uh, relevant. And, you know, I, I think, again, I see patients every week who have ALS, and I do a lot of this stuff, and, and I, I can explain to them how, including the patient you saw, who uh, had, he knows that this mouse was sort of made after his family and, and, and how this was, and, of course, he's much more interested in this. <laughs> which, which drugs are you making from this discovery to do something with? Um, he also wanted the, the disease named after him. I don't know. <laughs> he, said, he said, well, can, this is wonderful. Can you name the disease after me? I said, well, Lou Gehrig already has it, you know, so it's taken in the U.S. at least. Um, but yeah, so no, so so this is the end, and I've already touched on these things. You know, can you explain selective vulnerability by specific targets in these cells? Perhaps, and there's ways that we can look at this. And then, can you explain number one the diffuse pathology that you see everywhere? Because in the context of stress, these proteins may tend to aggregate, and it may, and again, requires this pre-unrelated domain that's multifunctional. It likely mediates interactions with other proteins and lots of things. Um, and that might explain this, but then this is the other thing which we're not really doing much of now, but a lot of people are. If you have a prion in the word of this, can it, can it mediate spreading of misfolded proteins? And if you may have been following this literature, both in all forms of neurodegenerative disease, people are trying to argue that misfolded proteins may be able to spread cell to cell, and that it could explain why you get degeneration along a particular network so the, there's initiation tendency in one type of cell, but then it tends to spread through cells in that particular network. And perhaps, you know, if you have this type of a, of a propagating misfolded protein, you could explain that. Um, I think there's a lot of barriers. I mean, I'm not jumping on this bandwagon, to be honest with you. I think it's a, but it's a very interesting hypothesis, and it should be investigated because we have nothing else to really explain this clinical phenomenon that we've been seeing for, you know, 140 years. So that's it. Uh, just to point out the people who did the work, uh, Iga Vegarzushka in my lab uh, made the mice. Uh, Maria and Rodrigo did uh, the analysis of the in vitro stuff. And of course, Bob Darnell, who we're now collaborating with and funders. So thank you very much. <laughs>